spend the semester on. Uh, and so I decided uh, to spend two lectures on it and do it uh, relatively carefully. Now, we've done a lot of details in the MRA theorem. Basically, I can't avoid doing some details here, but I think they're very fascinating. They bring in some ideas that are a little bit different. But I'll also try to make it conceptual, so I'll try to balance it a little bit better than I probably did with the MRA theorem. Now, uh, so since I'm going to spend two lectures on wavelet packets, um, the, uh, I, I, I want to tie some things together. Uh, Will, uh, we've, we've made a decision, and I hope it's okay, that instead of Tuesday, December 2nd, we'll meet on Monday, December 1st. Okay. And, and it'll be in room 1310. So last week, uh, Emily talked about frame uh, frames, but wavelet frames. And did she sing the baby? What's that? Emily? No, she did not. Oh. I haven't heard back from her. She said she'd send us the PDF for the slides because she wanted to make some changes to them, but I haven't heard back from her. Oh, it, but as opposed to references, I need to do references. But, uh, you want references too? Or? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Okay, so basically, the material she talked about um, is all found in it's a wonderful book by. Uh, Holy Christensen. And then gives it, the title of it is uh, Sufficient and Necessary Conditions for Wavelet Frames. That's the section of the book. He's written a book in my series and a very good book. Uh, and the theorem she proved goes back to Ingrid Obashi's who has a version of it in her book, which appeared in Cyan Publications in 1992. And this is one of the great books in the book. Uh, and basically, uh, Emily did it for RD, and the version you see in Christensen's book is for R, but there's no, this is one of those cases where you put a D above the R, it works. Nothing conceptually different at all. Uh, so, the most that's the major references because the proof in Christensen is done in wonderful detail. Well, the, uh, the so there's this theory of of uh, frames. The frames go back to basically Riemann, and then Riemann Weber. And then Dini, when he figured out that uh, these non-harmonic Fourier series arose from some of these PEs. And then the work of Birkhoff, the father. And, and then the work of Paley and Lina. And then the work of Burling and Valley of in the 60s, the Peter and the Atka. And prior to that was the spectacular paper by Duffin and Schaefer on frames. Essentially, they were what are called Fourier frames. And then you can have Gabor frames and Weber frames and general frames, which uh, also uh, uh, our boys, uh, which, which Duffin and Schaefer also uh, talk about general frames. And then there was a wonderful paper that appeared in 1986, and it's a paper by uh, Yves Meyer, Peter Dobuchis, and Grossman, Alex Grossman, who's a very senior theoretical physicist. And they tied this theory of frames business that had been building up through the years from these names that I just mentioned. They tied it together with uh, the emerging theory of wavelengths and some of the business going on in Gabo too. And it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And it's uh, relatively straightforward to read. He's a great writer. His name is Young. The name of the book is Non-Harmonic uh, Fourier Series. It's a very, very good book. Uh, it gives a sort of technical introductory material on this subject, but also tells you some open problems. 
Okay, so this wave of frames. Now, prior to Emily's lecture, we have been talking about multi-resolution analysis, right? And so, basically, uh, it's very natural to ask them about, and multi-resolution analysis is a waveless theory. So it's very natural to ask them about uh, MRA frames. And uh, that theory has certainly been built up, and it's the next chapter in Christensen from where this theory is that she talked about last week. And uh, we've had uh, a fair amount to do with that uh, through the years. And basically, a frame MRA is the following. We'll, we'll stick with just L2 of our uh, definition. Seems like a cheap definition, but certain things are different. And one of you is actually going to report on it, uh, on the reports, right? But VJ P is a frame MRA if, and we have all the usual conditions for the VJs. So if VJ uh, closed linear subspace, so it's a frame MRA of L2 of R. If VJ is closed linear subspace of L2 of R, the VJs are included, are VJ plus one, and I'm going to go up here so I don't have to squeeze things in. The intersection of the VJs uh, is the zero element, and the union is dense. And the only difference, as I say, this seems like a cheap definition, the only difference is, and we're now saying that ta and B is a uh, frame of definition of frame again for the second or third time last week, so I won't repeat it. But for an MRA, we've developed our theory for orthonormal bases. And this theory here is for frames. And I, once again, I recommend, although some of the original papers are very readable, I must say, uh, Christensen's presentation is also very good. Uh, but then uh, th there's a case one can do, which actually was the way Yves Mayer first developed this whole theory, and it's for the case of, of respaces, and that's the same as what are called bounded. Unconditional bases. And I'm going to stop there for a moment just because I don't know how to do this linearly. And uh, the last time we talked with each other, uh, I had just finished the MRA theorem, the proof of And the, uh, we saw in that last part of the proof that uh, there was sort of different technology involved. The first part is essentially the part that goes back to the speech processing community. And that's when we constructed those filters that behave in a certain way. And then in this second part, it essentially goes back to the image processing people where we actually used the, the structure of the spaces BJ. And uh, then at that point, I stated some results uh, giving an example. And the, the nice example.
example was that the high wavelength system, which we worked very hard to define, uh, and we never mentioned MRA in that process, but the high wavelength system was really an MRA. And so once you proved that the high system was an MRA, you could get all the business about high wavelengths from the MRA theorem. Right? So uh, I'm going to leave this here because I want to come back to it. But I want to come back to it uh, but by first repeating uh, the, the business I ended up with last time where I talked about the highs giving rise to an MRA. Okay. So, um, what, is, what does unconditional mean? Or are you going to You know what? Maybe I can define it at any time. Uh, the, so basically, uh, you have a basis. Uh, we're just being a shower basis. So let me just say it. Means we've got a, um, a Hilbert space, and we have a sequence of elements in that Hilbert space, say, that form a basis for it. And that means that every element has a unique representation as a sum of coefficients depending on the element times the basis of it. So that's that's a, a basis. No, nothing orthogonal uh, here. In fact, what I just said holds for lots of uh, spaces, and I'm going to say something about that. And then unconditional, so that's a basis. Unconditional basis means that we're going to get the same answer no matter about ordering and things like that. Uh, that uh, well, you know, sometimes things converge conditionally. You you, uh, you have to you have to take them in a certain order. Now there are other very uh, quantitative ways of, of describing unconditional, but I'm not going to do that here for the reasons of time. And then bounded means that if I look at the norms of each of the basis elements, there are constants C and D, such that for every basis element, its norm is bounded above by D and below by C, and C is bigger than above. And so that's a bounded unconditional basis. And that turns out to be the same as a respaces. I mean, basically, these respaces uh, began with a sort of a different uh, idea. They were essentially topological isomorphisms of uh, orthonormal bases. And so to prove that these things are equivalent requires some work. And uh, by the way, there's a very nice proof of that equivalence in uh, Young's book. So orthonormal bases. Every orthonormal basis is a respaces. In fact, uh, in every respaces is a topological isomorphism of some orthonormal basis. And every, and these are actual bases. Okay. And now it turns out every respaces is a frame. And frames are not necessarily bases. So that's the setup. And so after I recall what we said at the very end of last class, I'm going to come back to bounded unconditional basis. So the thing I said at the very end of last class was um, we stated this uh, proposition. And I think I said how it was proved, but I've been doing so many details, I, I decided to spare you the details, but it's not so difficult. And basically, this is concerning the ha, alpha ha, MRA for. LP of R. Now P is going to be uh, in one. Okay. And the proposition says the following. Uh, it says that let P be equal to the characteristic function of 0, 1. Okay? And that is going to turn out to be the scaling function for the higher and higher. And we have P in, zero, in 1 infinity. And set V0 uh, equal to the sum, the set of all sums, A n ta n B, where A n is a sequence in little l P. So we're 
defining that. And then also define for each j, we're going to set bj equal to be the set of all g of t's, which are of the form 2 to the j over p, and that's just for normalization purposes, f of 2 to the j t, where f is in v0. Then, the statement of the result is that then <coughs> vj is an MRA of LP of R in the sense that it satisfies all those conditions of an MRA with the subspace of B with scaling function phi it's going to satisfy some properties with scaling function phi um, and so what's phi going to do? Well, in the case of L2 where if um, P equals 2 this set here taught in phi is an orthonormal basis for V0 and for um, other values of P and for other a little bit careful here because uh, give, me, give me 30 seconds. Uh, so let me take P bigger than 1. Um, so I'm not sure of this. This is a moment of truth. <laughs> uh, see the reason I'm, uh, when P is equal to 1 there are no orthonormal. There are no unconditional bases for L1. But I guess we can get unconditional bases for subspaces. So it, it might be true that it's an unconditional basis for L1 for, for the subspace. And for other P bigger than or equal to 1, Ta and V is an unconditional basis for um, well, it's also bounded. It's a bounded, unconditional basis for uh, B0. Bounded, unconditional basis. What was that? Okay. So that's the theorem, and and I I, I left out the details of the proof, proof, although I've done it in my notes, and uh, uh, the only. Thing I'm a little bit uh, not 100% sure of is uh, I know there are no unconditional bases for all of L1. This is probably true, but I'm not 100% sure. That's something we can verify. Yeah. You've mentioned before there's no unconditional bases for L1 of R. Is that easy to prove? No. Sure. Okay. Absolutely not. Okay. It's, it's actually quite difficult to prove. In fact, it's, people have been worried about bases for a long, long time, and it was only first proved in 1961 by. Polish mathematician Palczynski. Uh, well, I think if you Google Palczynski, I don't, I mean, I've got it someplace, but I don't know exactly yeah, they, you know, where. Bother. I'm sorry? You know how to bother. Just quiz? There's the moment of P truth. P E L C Z, I mean, there's a lot of consonants here. Uh, <laughs> P E L C Y, I'm peeking here because I might have it here. C Y N S K I. Thank you. And, uh, and actually, subsequent to, uh, we were quite interested in L1 MRAs because, uh, this is just a, an aside, we were quite fascinated with the Tauberian theorem. And the Tauberian theorem, uh, the Venus Tauberian theorem is essentially an L1 result. And it 
essentially gives you uh, completeness. And so we wanted to do waiver theory for NRAs in L1 using the Tiberian theorem. And uh, I must say, I never did anything with it the first time. But uh, one of my students did, uh, Gary Zimmerman. But uh, uh, it's something where he stopped working on it, and there are a lot of very interesting questions associated with that. So if anyone is interested in that topic, uh, I'm happy to continue talking about it. Okay, now, also at the end, of, so the point is we have bounded unconditional bases here uh, when we're talking about L2, and uh, in the sense that they're in between here. Now, this result here, where we've only done MRAs, we've done the MRA theory to get a, uh, a basis for L2 of R when we have an MRA. We're not saying anything about getting basis for all of L, uh, LP, but you can. This is exactly what happens. If you have an MRA this way, then you can get a basis for all of LP, uh, at least for P bigger than 1. And with those bases now are unconditional bases except when P is equal. Okay. So that's the, uh, and, and that's why I want to start this way for perspective. And even if I was going a little bit too fast, it's, uh, it's on the, the audio record. Um, now, at the end of last class, Brent asked a question. He said, are there any other bases besides these MRA bases or the ones I talked about with wavelet sets that, uh, that look like wavelets? And it was exactly a, a great lead-in question because there are tons and tons of them. And so let's, let's write down some of them. And this is going to be the background for getting towards doing uh, wavelet packets. Okay, so I'm going to erase this now. We all know that uh, we have a normal class schedule, except on this first week of December, the class will be on Monday at uh, uh, the first. Actually, uh, uh, Tom mentioned he did the blackboard for me class, which is, of course, as sure as a May, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, the, this, this way I, I uh, do the blackboard, uh, it's, uh, it actually is efficient for getting the chalk in the chalkboard, unless it's really a messy board, which it is at this stage of the day, but I had a colleague years and years ago who, uh, about my age, and unfortunately passed away in his 30s get very much involved in uh, education, besides being a very good research mathematician. And he taught me this technique, too. So I think a lot of strokes. OK, so let uh, dj t d in mra of l2 uh, well, you know what? Uh, excuse me for not seeing. Uh, since we have been talking about bases, and you, uh, at least two of you showed interest in Pelczynski's result, there's, there's a very famous problem. Uh, it's been solved globally, but there are lots and lots of very difficult subproblems. And it's basically called, a lot of things it's called basis problem. So let B be a complex finite space. So um, back, which is easy to prove, if B uh, has a basis, then it is uh, separable. that means it has a countable dense subset. So the converse question is called the basis problem. Question, if B is separable, does it 
have a shadow basis. And that just means this unique representation that I talked about. Shadow And the answer is no, not general. And the uh, solution was given by Pierre Enflo in the early 1970s. And uh, what, what is interesting about that is uh, he uses, well, many things interesting about it. It's a very difficult problem to solve. But he uses um, lack and airy Fourier series to, in, in the proof, and I think that's pretty good. Okay. What are they called? What, what kind of Fourier series? Uh, lack and airy. That lack and airy means gaps, like the lacuna. And... Uh, Basically, uh, a, a, a lack of area. So you, you may have a series that looks like this. Some A uh, lambda E to the 2 pi I, or lambda N. Right? E to the 2 pi I T lambda N. So the lambda Ns are integers. Do you, so it's a Fourier series type form, lambda n and z. But what we have is that we have the lambda n plus 1 over lambda n is always, say, bigger than or equal to some number like 2. So there's, there's going to be exponentially big gaps there. And these types of sets arise in lots of places. And in harmonic analysis, there's a lot going on. Basically, I think research came to a slowdown because the problems were so difficult. And they became known as Cedon sets and a lot of work on Helsin sets, and they give rise to these so-called thin sets of harmonic analysis. So a fascinating subject. It arose in complex analysis when one was wondering about uh, boundary values of, of analytic functions. But uh, there you go. Okay, so now we're getting back to Brent's question. So let DJP be an MRA of L2 of I. And let's, uh, let's pick a node. Uh, so, thus, ta and phi is an orthonormal basis for V0. Well, we know then also, that if I went down a notch to V minus 1, um, that uh, I can make an orthonormal basis for V minus 1 in terms of the dilation of the feet. Right? But I can make another orthonormal basis for V0 by using the fact that V0 is the orthogonal direct sum. guys. And you remember, so V0 is equal to that, and ta and ta and psi is an orthonormal basis for W0. Okay, that was the whole point of the first half of the proof of this MRA theorem. We had to come up with this function in W0 uh, that was a, was a translates to an orthonormal, orthonormal basis for W0. And that's where we use the filter theory, which essentially is the coding theory that comes from speech processing. So, uh, and so because of this now, we can say that uh, Therefore, um, the functions, I have to normalize them correctly, 1 over the square root of 2, phi of t over 2 minus n. Well, I, if I look at all those guys, that's going to be an orthonormal basis of v minus 1. And if I look at all of these guys, psi, 
of t over 2 minus n. And I let n then run through all the integers. The psi guys are an orthonormal basis of w minus 1. And so therefore, these functions <coughs> form an orthonormal basis for v0. So without even trying, uh, we started off with an orthonormal basis for, z, for v0, and we then trivially wrote down a different one. Okay? And now you see we've disguised the limit. Uh, so, but, uh, and so I'll write down a couple more. But, but let's make this as an exercise uh, maybe, okay? Uh, so let me go over this board here. So I'll, I'll say it explicitly right now. Uh, so the exercise is to prove, prove these formula. It's, it's an easy exercise. But, uh, to prove that the sequence of functions of this form form an orthonormal basis for V0. Okay. And once we have that, then the uh, well, let's, let's just draw this picture because we're going to spend a lot of time with this picture later today. Once we have that, then if we look at V0. Uh, excuse me, Professor. Sure. Isn't that, I mean, haven't we pretty much already proven that? What it, what's left to prove? Well, as I say, it's easy. Basically, you're right, it's easy. I mean, these guys here you have to prove belong to V minus 1. These guys here have to prove belonging to W minus 1. They are automatically orthogonal because they were orthogonal when you move up. Uh, okay. They have normal. Well, they're just little things to check. It's, Pro, uh, okay. it's an easy exercise, you're right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so the picture we have now, if we start off with any node V, J, let's say V0. So this is v minus 1 and w minus 1. And then there's v minus 2, w minus 2. And then there's v minus 3, w minus 3, etc. Now, what wave packets do is answer the question filling in this big blank. Okay. What would be, given an MRA, what would these spaces be? I mean, basically I have a node there, W minus 1. What would we do if we made a tree here? What would those spaces be? Okay. So that's something you can mull over well, on my sonorous tone. But for the time being, let me just write out another orthonormal basis and then uh, move on a little bit. So, so for any m, we have that uh, v0, we already know this from the way we define these guys, is equal to v minus m and then the direct sum of w minus m is the orthogonal direction. W minus m plus 1 all the way up to W minus 1. And so because of that, I mean, basically, uh, because of this picture, therefore, the sequence of functions, we're going to do the same thing we did over there, but an easy exercise. The sequence
sequence of functions where we have uh, phi minus m n. Okay, that's m is fixed. And then we're going to go up to uh, psi minus m n. Then we're going to go psi minus m plus 1 n. All the way up to psi minus 1 n as n runs through z is an orthonormal basis for um, v search. And so it's easy, but we've built uh, the structures there, so why not say what we can get out of it? make more of an normal basis than you think we'd want. But once we fill in the rest of the tree, we're going to really go bananas. Okay? Uh, but there's a reason for doing that too. It is, I, I don't want to just do something for the sake of doing it. There's, there's just a lot of uh, uh, rationale for, for doing that sort of thing. And this leads to a very special case, the so-called Walsh functions, which have a, a, a lot of applications and uh, some of those applications are uh, to coding theory, and there are uh, a number of unsolved problems in that area. Okay, so if you recall, we're all, I'm going to spend maybe another five minutes to get before I get to uh, wavelet packets, and I'm going to essentially go back to the statement of the MRA theorem. Uh, in the following way. So in the MRA theorem, you recall, we had an MRA, don't remind, and VJ and phi, and because it was an MRA, we formed a sequence of coefficients H0 of N and a filter H conjugate mirror filter, zero. And then, in order to form psi, the, uh, the uh, wavelet in W0, we formed H1 of N and H1, the Fourier series cars with these as their Fourier coefficients. And um, basically, you remember what H1 was. I, in the proof of the theorem, I did it one way, but uh, this is perhaps a little more conventional. Recall that uh, H1 of n can be written down in terms of H0. And we have this is equal to minus 1 to the n, H0 of minus n plus 1. Okay, so it's just a that just came out of the, when we, when we, in the proof when we were constructing these uh, filters. Now, in particular, if we do the, do the arithmetic out, we have an H1 of gamma, the Fourier series whose coefficients of the H1s are equal to minus e to the 2 pi i gamma, H0 of gamma minus 1 half. So in the MRA theorem, this was all part of it. I mean, in the MRA theorem, I just stressed the fact that we constructed a function psi in W0, where psi m to n was an orthonormal basis for L2 of i. But in order to do it, we had to construct these conjugate mirror filters. Okay. And so um, as an exercise, uh, Let's look back at the old Shannon wavelet. And uh, in fact, uh, I can't remember if this is an exercise already or not, but why don't you take it down as one uh, name? If it is already there, then so be it. Part of it is not there, but part of it might be. So, so you, you remember when we did the Shannon function, the Shannon function. 
was um, side of t, and I'm going to take omega equal a half to the machine. The way I originally did it for any old omega, but let's take omega equal a half. So it's equal to uh, the Dirichlet function, 2 uh, pi minus d pi t. And we had an orthonormal, we, we had the, I didn't stress it as an orthonormal, as a multi-resolution analysis. I only stressed the Haas as being a multi-resolution analysis. But this, could, this is a multi-resolution analysis too, in the following sense. Um, let um, the phi of t be equal to um, um, satisfied p hat of gamma equal to characteristic function of uh, minus one half oops, one half and so that means it really does come from a Dirichlet function that's modulated in order to move it to center. So it's a, well, that's just the, uh, the Dirichlet function, the phi. Well, if you define phi this way, and you define the V0 to be the closed linear span of the translates of that phi, then you get a multi-resolution analysis. So the exercise is, and Nate probably knows better than anyone in the room whether it's already there or not. But uh, so given uh, phi, define S as above here, define V0 to be equal to the closed linear span of the set of tau and phi, and define j uh, as scaled versions of v0. Uh, and what we want to do is we want to prove uh, prove vj v is an MRA of L2 of a half. That's one thing. And we want to uh, compute H0 and H1. And in order to do that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's rather easy. Um, we get that, uh, in fact, I'll give you the answer. I mean, how do we compute H0? We have the dilation equation already in place. So, uh, so I don't get the uh, constants wrong here. When we do it out, we get that we obtain that H0 is equal to the characteristic function at the square root of 2 of uh, minus 1 fourth, 1 fourth. And we get that H1 is equal to the gamma. Is equal to the square root of 2 e to the 2 i i gamma h0 of uh, gamma plus a half. Okay. And so, and uh, I have a minus over there. I guess I used the other form. It doesn't matter. So here I use the minus n minus 1. But what's going on when I do that? And what's going on when I do that is we really see um, you know, the following phenomenon. I 
I said I was going to have class a few minutes shorter, but it may even be shorter than that since we're really running out of time. Uh, the, um, um, so first of all, 8-0 is this, just comes from the dilation equation. It comes from square root of 2 p hat of 2 gamma is equal to h0 of gamma p hat of gamma. And we know what phi hat is. It's just that characteristic function there. And so that forces h0 to be that guy there. Something I think everyone will believe. Uh, but what I want to point out is that in this case we really do see that I mean, we're looking at this as a one periodic function. So we're looking at H0, there's 0, and there's uh, 1 half, and minus a half. And what we have is we've got this function here, which is H0. And so, but it's defined periodically. Not once in a while, that means we need to find periodic. That joke that I've been doing it for years, and I'm not sure why I keep doing it. So there's one, there's uh, three halves, and so I just add one to it, and so there it is, and another manifestation of it on line, et cetera. Uh, minus one. Okay, so. There is this funnier constant in front here, which I can't draw so easily. But the interesting thing is that, that, that when I look at what h0 of gamma plus a half is, let's see what's going on there. When I look at what h gamma plus a half is, um, we get the following. If gamma, Gamma is in uh, minus one half, one half. Then just writing it out, we have h one of gamma is equal to the square root of two e to the two pi i gamma uh, times the characteristic function of minus one fourth, one fourth of a gamma plus a half. Now, suppose, and we define it one periodically. Well, suppose gamma is in 0, 1, 4. So it's in here. And so that implies that um, gamma plus a half is in one half and three fourths. And so that implies that H1 of gamma is equal to zero. So that means if we're taking gammas in here, then when we go up we look at gamma plus a half, we're going into this interval here, which is like, if we're staying in the interval minus a half to a half, which is like coming back to this interval here. And we're saying that H1 is zero, is uh, uh, H1, of, if gamma's in here, because H0 is 0 here, then it's going to be 0 here, which means that H1 is 0 here. And that's the, the punchline in some sense. When I play that game, what I'm going to get is, if I look at 0, 1 half, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, minus a half, now the, these filters are all defined on the torus. Okay? They drive the theory on the real line. Well, 
this is the low pass filter, the H0. And the high pass filter really is going to be defined out here. I'll use a little shot line. And that's H1. By the same argument I used just now. Basically, if I take gamma in here, I'm going to get the value of H1 over here. Okay? And similarly, if I take gamma in here, I'm going to get the value of H1 over here. So that's, I mean, the fact that it's moving that way is rather relevant. All this goes back to this Maurice Escher business I talked about. Uh, but what we really have is, I mean, it's a classic uh, high pass, low pass filter situation. The H0 is, I mean, it's a textbook example, but the, the H0 is a, a low pass filter, and the H1 really is a high pass. that means is that if I multiply that times some other function, it's low pass in the sense it's going to zero out anything with higher frequency. Uh, I, I heard almost all of it, but I'm not sure. You speak very softly. What was that again? Uh, so you mean like a multiplier? Yes, yes. A, a multiplier or yeah. a just multiplier? No, no, multiplier. I'm sorry. Yeah, because basically these things come from uh, translation invariant systems, which are convolution systems, and this is on the Fourier side. So we're just multiplying a signal times this filter, and here is a clear cut case where it zeroes out. Um, now, one of the things one might do is the following there's a, a a natural picture, or two natural pictures that arise. One is the following. Um, suppose I think of uh, the space V0 this way. And then I want to well, make a bunch of it right now. Well, I'm so when we did our splitting, what we had was we had this was v minus one and this was w. And then, the way the splitting went after that, we had V minus 2 and W minus 2. And mind you, this is getting ever more titillating. I'm trying to build up the drama here of how you fill in the blanks here, okay? So uh, uh, here, we're going to split again, V minus 3, W minus 3. Etc. Well, we're leaving out tremendous amounts of space in this uh, suggestive drawing. Another way of making this suggestive drawing is to use this sort of picture. Now, mind you, um, well, so it's a little more speculative, but the same sort of thing is going on. If I think of the filter itself, then I, I want to think now is going from minus a half to a half. And basically, at the first cut, I'm having, that's why I did the channeling. It's so clear cut. I mean, typically with sines and cosines, there's 
going to be overlapping. They're still high low pass filters. And the uh, sign, absolute value of the sign being a, a, a high pass filter in a certain sense. But, uh, but basically, we have uh, a low pass filter is going to be like this. And then the high pass is going to be like that. And then at the next step, when I do one more step down of scaling, now that's a one periodic function, that h0 and h1. When I do one step down of scaling, I'm going to be shrinking this. Okay? And, um, and, and basically, now the low pass will be here, and the high pass will be here. Now, because of the periodicity, we're going to get other stuff here. But uh, I'm, I'm talking a little bit with my in a tiny eight style here, but, uh, but, but we can make it precise. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that, first of all, there's the intellectual demand to fill in the spaces here. There's the uh, bricklayer demand to uh, see what other types of uh, architecture one can get if one were able to fill in the blanks here. Because, I mean, this architecture will be regular and, and when you do the periodicity out, but it turns out you can get some rather dramatic differences between the possible. Okay, so that's the whole lead in to uh, uh, the, the business with uh, wafer packets. And now let me begin with wafer packets. And I said no breaks, but I, I want to take a one minute break to, to speak uh, to Brent.